Okay, today I'm going to critique a specific episode of the PBS show Eons, which I just want to say first, I really do enjoy this show, but there's one thing that caught me that I just need to correct them on. I'm going to be polite about it. This episode aired about a week ago, actually a week ago. It's called That the Time Oxygen Almost Killed Everything. And as far as I can tell, overall, it's a pretty good episode, except they screwed up on one part, and I'm going to explain why. I had to gorilla shoot this. I apologize for that, but the clip's only 20 seconds, so here we go. Temperatures dropped so drastically that it triggered a global glaciation, and our once balmy water world became shrouded in ice. There may have been several pulses of these icy events, but by far the biggest of them came to be known as the Huronian glaciation, and it lasted for about 300 million years. Between these huge changes... First of all, I would like to give her props on mentioning the Huronian glaciations because when people think ice ages, they usually just think the quaternary of the past 2.3 million years. But Earth's been having ice ages on and off for a long time, and the Huronian's the first true uh, evidence in the geologic record for extensive glaciation. Now, I am one of those people who doesn't buy the whole snowball Earth thing. Um, I, and it hasn't been, it's still in the hypothesis stage. It's still not a theory. Um, but, um, I do want to give her props for at least doing that much. Um, for those of us who study the Huronian, um, that, uh, statement about the, uh, glaciation lasting 300 million years is just incorrect. The Huronian supergroup, the depositional period, of that supergroup was about 300 million years, but it's not all glacial deposits. And that's what that little clip from the video definitely gives you the uh, perception of. But um, me and some people have been working on for quite some time a compilation of, uh, of deposits of geologic units in the Midwest uh, within the Precambrian. And this is the latest version of that. Um, if you go in and you zoom in, you can see uh, um, where the Huronian sits and the Marquette Supergroup and the Calco Clay Group, which is within it. And these things kind of correlate. We do know that now. Um, so that's just bits and pieces from the publication uh, that we've been working on. This is publication G-012011-1J. And what that means is... Uh, We've been working on this since 2011, and in 2011, I did a uh, preliminary examination of the Huronian supergroup, but in, and it's 2017 now, but in the past six years, we have learned a lot. Well, so what have we learned? Um, in 2011, there were a couple papers uh, that came out um, to, trying to bracket the Huronian supergroup. We've known for a long time that deposition of this group began about 2.5 billion years ago and stopped at about 2.2 billion years ago. Probably a little earlier than that it stopped. Um, so there's your 300 million years right there. So, But this group is the first evidence of... Uh, a passive margin development, which means we had modern plate tectonics in operation. And this package of rocks is extremely thick. We're talking dozens of miles thick. So the, the, this is thicker. The Huronian supergroup is thicker than all the Paleozoic rocks on the continental United States. All right. So it's an extremely thick unit. And it begins with volcanics at its base. And it goes up and shows... Uh, passive margin development as a rift for as a successful rift formed um, now punctuated within this are glacial periods but they're not 300 million years by any means they're not that lengthy um, after uh, 2011 more work tried to be done uh, people started pulling zircons from more of the lava units um, which you can get direct dates for, and zircons from the sedimentary units, which, as, as I've said before, you cannot get direct dates for, but it will tell you that the rock is definitely younger than your youngest zircon, all right? And they've also picked uh, certain hydrothermal marker events. So basically, in a nutshell, we've gotten a lot of information since then. So the... Uh, 
so what this is here is this is a chart I did last month to try to update our present knowledge and kind of consolidate it. This is the legend for that um, for that uh, publication. Now, as you can see here, the Huronian supergroup, when they talk about the Huronian glaciations, most people refer to the Gauganda, which is formation, the Coleman member, which is the basal member, the basal formation of the Cobalt group. And the reason why is because those glacial deposits extend into uh, Michigan, all right, into the Upper Peninsula. Uh, the older ones, there are a couple older ones, but they don't extend outside of southern Ontario. And the Gauganda is prevalent in southern Ontario. And not only does it mark the beginning of extensive glaciation, but the first free oxygen in the atmosphere is in here. So we are actually getting glaciers. Now, in the video earlier, she says at 2.8 billion years, oxygen started to be put into the atmosphere. That may have been true. Um, but at during the deposition of the Gauganda, it became concentrated enough to uh, begin getting red beds. So we start getting rusting of sediments, which we never got before in the geologic record. So this pumping of oxygen into the atmosphere is known as the Great Oxygenation Event, or GOE. Sometimes it's referred, biologists use a different term, I forget what it is off the top of my head. Um, but this is when free oxygen started to fill the atmosphere. Now, the first red beds are younger than the first glacial uh, deposits that we get. So there may have been some trace oxygen in the atmosphere from 2.8 to 2.2. Uh, two, three billion years ago, but it wasn't enough to rust the beds. Um, but after that, it was. So by the time the Gauganda began being deposited, which is where the most extensive uh, uh, glaciations are, at about 2.323 billion years ago, and as you can see here, I've put the age picks in millions of years before present. The whole Gauganda formation uh, wasn't even deposited in a 10 million year period. Uh, that's, a <laughs> that's a lot less than 300 million. Uh, and what I mean by age picks in millions of years before present is because using the available data that we have at present and the zircons that we have, that's the depositional uh, framework that it's that, that the Gauganda was likely deposited in within that time frame like I said we've got a lot more refinement on this stuff and as you can see uh, here we have red beds start to become common but the first appearance they don't become common to the Lorraine formation and the glaciers were gone by then and when I say great oxygenation oxygenation event GOE uh, it's not like we went from zero oxygen to our present levels of 21% overnight. It actually was in parts per million for millions of years. So it was enough to get into the atmosphere, but it didn't start to really build up until the late Precambrian. So, um, so there seems to be three separate major glacial events within the Gauganda. Uh, on here it's G31, G32, and G33. You know, subscript 3. And those seem to... G... G3... What was that? G31 and G32 uh, likely correlate with the deposits in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Um, G33 seems to be absent in those places, and there's a large unconformity between the glacial diamectin and its equivalents in the UP as where deposition in southern Ontario with the Huronian supergroup seems to be continuous. Something else we are really missing from the uh, Huronian uh, supergroup uh, that proponents of Snowball Earth like to claim as a key indicator that after glaciations a hothouse environment formed was carbonate deposits. Well, the uh, Huronian supergroup does have carbonate deposits, and they are among the oldest on the planet. Um, but the thing is, they don't really, uh, <laughs> there's no cap carbonates. Um, they're just not there. Uh, within the Quirk Lake group, you have the Espanola carbonates upon the Bruce diamectin. 
Uh, but on top of the Ramsey Lake and the Hoff Lake group, you've got shale and sandstone. And then on top of the Gauganda, you get the Lorraine. And the bottom of that is sort of shaley, but it quickly becomes a sandstone. There's no carbonates at all until the Gordon Lake formation, which is above the Lorraine, considerably above it. And here, this chart is a detailed chart that I uh, took from uh, Mentiers. I believe is how his name is pronounced. It's a 2000 paper. The citation's on the bottom. It's also in my references at the end. Um, so, basically, the glacial periods within the Huronian supergroup, each glacial pulse, if you will, doesn't seem to have taken much longer than the present 2.3 million year uh, cycle. I mean, now, within each sub-cycle, there may have been uh, phases within that, like we have, but each sub-cycle doesn't seem to be more than a couple million years, kind of like today. So it's very unlikely that this was a global event. It may be, have been in a very extensive ice age, but the, but the fact that these deposits, now these deposits are thick, but you can get really thick tillites. Uh, we refer to the Precambrian rock form of till as tillites. You can get that in a couple million years. And the Gauganda, the Coleman member, that base, basal part with the diamectin, can be pretty thick. But it's on the order of modern ones. I mean, you get modern uh, glacial uh, diamectin deposits that are on the order of five, 600 feet thick. So I mean, it doesn't really indicate a snowball earth of anything, but just extensive glaciations. Now, there's paleomag data that suggests the Huronian during this time at least the beginning when rifting began was near the equator. But like I said, this is a active or a passive margin development from a rift. It, I mean, over a 300 million year period, you can move the continents pretty far in that time frame. So that's just my summary of our understanding of the Huronian supergroup.